So we're starting in one, two, three. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome. Um, I'll just give it a few seconds uh, to uh, for everyone to um, to join us in the room. Um, right. The, well, uh, there seems to be. A, a, Decent number of people in here, so I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, my name is Robert Colville. I'm director of the Centre for Policy Studies, and welcome to this um, absolutely fascinating, uh, hope, well, hopefully absolutely fascinating conversation on on the future of the city. Um, I have a, a really amazing panel um, with me uh, today. Um, uh, Lord Hill is um, obviously one of the most distinguished um, policy experts on this area. He's a former uh, EU commissioner um, when back when we were, of course, members of the EU um, covering financial services. He recently delivered the UK listings review uh, to the Chancellor uh, on how we can um, uh, strengthen, strengthen the city. Um, Claire Cole is the Director of Market Oversight at, at the FCA, so is responsible for um, either uh, you know, Im implementing Jonathan's report in full, or throwing it in the bin, or uh, <laughs> you know, whatever she uh, she feels like uh, responding to it. Um, and um, Tom Clockerty is the um, head of tax and editorial director here at the CPS, but he also covers regulation and, in particular, financial services regulation as, as part of his his brief, uh, his brief um, which is why I'm hosting so that he can actually um, express an opinion. Um, the format will be fairly familiar. Everyone will uh, give a few remarks. Uh, then uh, we're starting with Jonathan, and then we will. Um, uh, then we'll um, open it up to, to, to questions. Um, please submit them via the Q&A if you're joining us on Zoom, uh, the Q&A box, or if you're uh, watching on YouTube, Facebook or Twitter, then um, if you comment, then hopefully our team will spot that and, and, and feed them in to us. Um, I should have said also that uh, Jonathan is on the board of the Centre for Policy Studies, so I am automatically obliged to um, agree with literally everything he says. Um, <laughs> it's my boss. <laughs> but um, uh, it, We'll, we'll just start. I mean, uh, an absolutely fantastic, fa fa you know, of all the times to be talking about this, um, you know, the UK is finally free of the EU, the, um, you know, we have the opportunity to um, go our own way on, on, on regulation, but as yet, we do not have a, a sort of a, a clear picture of what exactly going, that, that, that means. Um, so hopefully, by the end of this, the, the hour, we will have charted a, a new course for regulating financial services, which will lead us to um, enormous prosperity. Um, and a glorious golden future. Uh, Jonathan, uh, do you want to kick off? Um, well, let me start with um, the point about the importance of regulation, really, because I think um, people often think of financial service regulation as being something that is um, kind of highly technical, boring subject that you really don't want to have to get involved with unless you need to professionally. And one of the things you know, I've learned over the years really is actually um, regulation is politics by another means. Uh, regulation, people often think of it as being a kind of science, uh, highly technical, there's a correct answer. Um, you know, I think regulators do their best to struggle with um, you know, a range of different issues and uh, through that to try to moderate society's appetite for risk. And I think my first point would be when you think about regulation and you think about the future of the city, that that I think in an ideal world, we should think of as a dynamic and evolving thing, not a static and conflictual thing. Most regulation comes about um, as a, as a kind of rear mirror uh, event, something goes wrong, people react, regulation gets put in. Normally the process of putting regulation in is painful and laborious in the European system in particular. Once you've set the regulatory framework, it's incredibly difficult to change because it's the, a consequence of um, the, the compromise based system that they have in the EU. So it takes a long time to introduce. It gets highly complicated during the legislative process. As a consequence, no one ever wants to touch it again afterwards. Um, so as the UK thinks about how to set about its financial service legislation outside the EU, that takes one to an obvious 
opportunity that the UK now has. We're not part of that consensus-based laborious process where the European Parliament in particular tends to complicate legislation and in, in, in crude terms takes a um, pretty risk-averse at attitude towards legislation. Um, so there are opportunities clearly for the UK as a unitary state to move faster, more intelligently, more proportionately, to use the, I think, current um, word of the moment, more nimbly in how um, we set about doing our um, regulation. And there, I think, in essence, is where the opportunity for the UK now lies, not in some um, uh, kind of self-conscious desire to diverge from other jurisdictions for the sake of it, not to rip everything up for the sake of it, <clears throat> because I think if you take as the starting point that we have an ambition to be a global financial center, then clearly it makes sense for us to follow global financial standards and indeed to carry on setting them as the UK has always been a, a, an active uh, part of that process. So it seems to me the talk that there was as part of the whole Brexit um, row about Singapore on Thames, the bonfire of red tape, all of that normal stuff, uh, I think that's the wrong way to think about it. Um, but what I do think is that particularly in areas which are not yet regulated for. So if you think about the discussion on green finance, if you think about the emergence of fintech, if you think about um, other, other areas of where the UK has strengths around life sciences, you can see, I think, opportunities for us to um, try to um, set our rules um, more swiftly, more competitively, more intelligently, uh, in order to make sure that the UK is a, is a very attractive place for people to do business. So I think we'll want to go for high standards, um, but I think we should also uh, recognize that um, there are definitely going to be opportunities outside the EU. Uh, unlike some on this call, I didn't vote for us to uh, leave the EU, Rob. But um, that having happened, it's clearly the case to me that um, our politicians, our regulators now have an, have an opportunity to set um, an appropriate regulatory framework, both for the UK and for us as a um, global centre. So look, let me stop there because you um, encouraged me beforehand not to not to talk for too long to kick off. Um, but I'm very happy to go down any any avenues that you and others want to go down in terms of issues like equivalence, the listings review that I've just carried out, where I think the government um, might be going and how we should think about uh, regulation more generally. Okay, well, well, thank you very, thank you very much. Um, uh, Claire. Uh... Well, thank you and thank you for the opportunity um, to speak today. I'm hoping you'll indulge me a little bit because obviously as a regulator, I'm the, the person responsible for implementing the Hill Review. Um, I, I might just talk for a couple of minutes about the impact that that has had on our plans over the coming year. And firstly, I, I want to take the opportunity to thank Lord Hill um, and his team for what has been an excellent piece of work in pulling together some really important proposals. But more than anything, it's really helped us to facilitate something that we had been hoping to do anyway, which is to push forward a wide ranging review of primary markets. I mean, post-Brexit, we, we talk about opportunity. We clearly have a new opportunity and an ability to shape our regulatory framework in a, a way that we just haven't had in the past. And for us, um, we're really looking forward to being able to look at a regime that specifically considers the context of the UK market. I mean, I should say, and this will come as no surprise as the regulator, we're not looking for change for the sake of change. We're not looking at quick fixes or seeking low standards, um, we still believe that competitive advantage is also 
helped and enhanced, not damaged by these strong standards and high levels of investor protection. So as a regulator, when we're implementing um, any of the changes in the Hill Review, we'll obviously be thinking about um, the, the wider context. I, I, I guess for a healthy and competitive market, it's important that we have both demand and supply. And um, you know, it's important that we're talking and hearing both the buy and sell side. And that's another area where I'm really grateful to Lord Hill for bringing together both sides of the debate and highlighting a really um, some really key areas that are particularly ripe for reform. So, I mean, the areas of immediate focus for us are going to be um, free float, dual class share structures, and the much discussed special purpose acquisition companies. And we're treating those responses as a priority. We're at the moment drawing up a set of recommendations and anticipate a consultation paper coming out fairly soon. And we're really key to try and respond at pace to some of those changes. And we're working through the FCA governance process at the moment. Um, and we'll obviously update as soon as we can on that. There are other areas of the both that come out of the Hill Review, but also from the work that we've been doing on primary market effectiveness that we want to think about. But they are to an extent impacted by um, longer timetables because we need legislative change, which means we need the support of HMT as well. I mean, Lord Hill's very helpfully identified in the context of a wider market review um, areas where we need to think about um, the, the prospectus directive as an example. We need to be able to better align prospectus documentation requirements with the type of transaction that's been undertaken. Um, we know that a further offer by a company that's already listed and trading on a public market is very different to um, a public offer by a private company. So there's lots of areas um, where we think there are um, further changes that we should be considering and making. The standard listing regime is another area um, that's highlighted in the Hill Review. Uh, the, those that are familiar, the standard market is a really diverse mix of different companies. We've got large overseas listed issuers. We have small microcaps, we have SPACs, GDRs and everything in between. So there's a, a need to look at how the, um, the wider ecosystem for listed companies in the UK works. And key for us will be ensuring that we have a cohesive regime. So I guess the, the, the message for us over the coming months is that we're really interested in hearing feedback and ideas on how we might be able to amend the regime to encourage uh, a, a much richer ecosystem here in the UK. Obviously, any changes are still subject to our own governance um, and consultation process, but uh, we're, we're very key, keen to make change. I think the other area that the FDA is really focused on at the moment is ESG, um, climate change and diversity in particular. You, you may have seen that we've introduced TCFD recommendations into our own rule book. But more recently, the CEO has spoken about the um, desire to have more diverse boards, particularly for listed issuers. And we obviously see the inherent value of a regime that's taken into um, taking those important areas really seriously. But I mean, more generally, we'll be continuing to look at ways to ensure London is seen as best, best in class. Um, I, I think I'll leave it there if that's OK. Brilliant. Uh, thanks. And uh, Tom? Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, so I think I, my main point, I think, is going to be that it's time for us to change the tune on financial services a little bit in this country um, and to stop thinking of the industry as the bad guys that caused the financial crisis um, and to start thinking more about how financial services can contribute to economic growth. Uh, both in their own right and by facilitating growth elsewhere. Um, I mean, I think for understandable reasons perhaps, but we've lost sight a little bit um, of the, the centrality of financial services to the UK economy, um, its contribution to GDP, um, its place as one of our main comparative advantages, um, one of our main sources of international competitiveness. Um, and so I think we need to stop sort of grinding the axe of a decade ago um, and, and start looking forward. And Brexit, in my view, um, and the regulatory divergence that that opens the door to um, is really the opportunity we've been waiting for, I think, to, to reprioritize growth, um, to reprioritize international competitiveness. Um, and in these few minutes, I don't want to get into um, sort of specific 
regulatory changes, but more um, just think a little bit about the principles that should drive our approach to the future of regulation um, with that goal of, of growth and competitiveness in mind. Um, so I'll start with basically three um, process things, if you like, um, which, are, which are fairly basic, but I think could be quite important. I think we need to stop excluding financial regulation from the targets that we set ourselves on the regulatory burden more broadly. Um, you know, in the past, that's that exclusion has happened on kind of two grounds. Um, one where regulation is to do with financial stability, we tend not to count it. Uh, and when it's derived from international institutions, we tend not to count it. Um, I think it's time to, to move on from that and, and assess financial regulation as part of the regulatory burden the way we do everything else. Um, I think we also need to think a bit more about um, the kind of unofficial forms of regulation, if you like. Um, things like guidance, information requests, inspections, um, which though I think underappreciated can often have just as large an impact as the rules and regulations that, that Parliament may set um, or, or, or the, the official rules that regulators may come up with um, themselves. Um, I think it would also be useful to give regulators a sort of clear objective um, to promote growth and competitiveness where they can. Um, so that's sort of process. What about substance? Um, and here, I think the key really is to focus our regulatory efforts on the things that really matter the most um, and to de-emphasize and, and apply a lighter touch elsewhere. And fundamentally, I think that we have financial regulation for, for two key reasons. Um, the first one, obviously, is to ensure financial stability. Uh, but it's important we don't use that as a, a carte blanche um, for, for whatever we, we, we might want to do. Um, because I think if you have simple, hard to game um, rules on capital requirements, leverage ratios, and so on, and you have an effective resolution regime, you're an awful lot of the way there to having an effective regulatory system from the standpoint um, of financial stability. I think the second key objective um, is to protect unsophisticated consumers. But I think we could put a lot more emphasis there on the unsophisticated uh, consumers bit um, and again, maybe operate a little bit of a lighter touch when it comes to business to business transactions, uh, when it comes to sort of wealthy and experienced investors, uh, maybe a little bit more caveat emptor could, can apply there. Um, what else? I think there are two sort of key themes that when we're looking forward, I mean, what I've just described have been the, the central purposes of financial regulation as long as the concept has existed, I think. Um, but as we look forward, there are a couple, of, um, a couple of other things that I think should be quite central to our thinking in this area. Um, the first is that I think regulation should seek to promote competition. Um, and actually, I think Britain does okay on this um, with things like open banking, I think, are fantastic. But we can do better, and it's important to, to maintain um, the sense of momentum and, and, and so on on competition. Um, the other thing, um, and again, actually, the FCA may be really a leader in this internationally, um, but is to embrace and to enable innovation. Um, you know, we need to bear in mind that the financial services industry, certain parts of it at least, could change quite dramatically in the years ahead uh, in a way that perhaps hasn't been the case in the past, when you look at things like big tech companies getting into providing what are sort of essentially banking services more and more, um, you can think of digital currencies, the potential for central bank issued digital currencies, a whole host of, of changes and the, the whole sort of panoply of uh, fintech that's out there and how that may change things. And I think you want regulation to enable and to encourage that never to stand in its way. And obviously things like the regulatory sandbox are very helpful in that respect. Um, so just one final point, and it, it stems out of that last thing about competition and about innovation. Um, we really need the regulator in this area um, to, to encourage dynamism, to never stand in the way of change. Um, and you know, <laughs> those aren't necessarily characteristics um, that you would associate traditionally with any kind of bureaucracy. Um, but I, I, Claire said best in class um, there, speaking about England and I think uh, speaking about the city of London. And I think if we're going to have a world beating financial sector, one that really makes a strong contribution um, to our economic growth and to our international competitiveness, um, then we're going to genuinely need a best in class regulator 
as well. And so that that really is the key challenge um, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, well, lots to, to, to go on there. Um, we've already got questions coming in, and please do do, do add some more. Um, and in fact, I, I can see someone who, I'm, who I think is a former Treasury Special Advisor who's, who's raised his hand who wants to contribute. Um, but I'll, um, if I can just pick up Jonathan on the um, uh, and, and 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 Claire and Tom as well on the on the point about equi equivalence. I mean, this has been the sort of the key debate. I mean, it, it struck it strikes me that th th there have been since Brexit there have been essentially two factions in the city. There are the um, the faction, the, the sort of faction, you know, and let's let's characterise this as, you know, stereotypically the sort of international international American banks who are using the UK as their European headquarters, who are very very keen for us to um, adhere very closely to European regulations, so it is less problematic to use the UK as a, as a base. And there is the there is there are other, there's others who say, fantastic, Brexit is here, let us um, sail off into into clear red, white, and blue blue waters i mean wh where do you think the debate is now and, and where, where do you think it it should be it should be going so i think there's been a um, shift uh, in mood and sentiment uh, at the end of last year when the nature um of brexit and the deal became clear and you know whichever position one might be adopting, um, I think the penny is dropping with people increasingly, uh, as I thought was pretty obvious from four and a half years ago, that if you um, decide not to be in the single market, uh, then, um, you know, <laughs> the world is going to change and that ease of doing business across the EU that you had is going to stop. And um, our former uh, European partners are not going to, uh, to coin a phrase, allow us to have our cake and eat it in terms of um, you know, deciding not to be in the market, but still wanting access to it. So I have always felt that we've had various versions of wishful thinking as to what might happen. Uh, and the latest manifestation of that was this equivalence debate. Will we get uh, equivalence? But you know, it, it had different permutations over the last couple of years. It morphed into, well, we must hold out for equivalence. Um, it, I never thought for one moment that the Europeans were going to give us a package equivalence deal. Uh, I used to do equivalence decisions in, in the EU. So I, I know how they think about this, which is as a, um, uh, 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 you know, it's like a Turkish bazaar for trading and giving access to your market is something that you don't do without something in exchange. And given the broader uncertainties about the UK EU relationship, Northern Ireland, the withdrawal agreement, you know, unilateral extension of grace periods, um, the way that the Europeans were always going to think about it was we 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 will not uh, give you um, a kind of blanket clarity on equivalence until we know where you are on a range of other issues. And even then we probably won't. So that to me, um, I, I, I think a, a, a broader realization that that isn't going to happen is now spreading through the market. And I think since December, there has been a shift of mood in the city uh, to the effect that we've got to put our best foot forward and get on with things, whatever we've inherited. The worst possible thing you can do is just to sit there and hope that the Europeans will come to our rescue. So I think that mood has certainly shifted. I think some of the media commentary in the first quarter of this year um, about the um, shifting of share trading to Amsterdam um, the uh, kind of burgeoning of SPACs in Amsterdam, I think crystallized in some people's minds that, um, you know, sentiment is incredibly important and momentum is all, uh, and that you need therefore to uh, get a move on. I think at the same time in our politics, we've now got a chancellor who uh, also recognizes that you've got to move on and since November I'd say the pace with which he has been announcing new initiatives the, the I mean last year the Khalifa review looking into solvency to the listing review that I chaired the announcement 
what, 10 days ago from John Glenn, the city minister, that later in the summer, the government's going to look at the whole nature of capital markets legislation. So there's gathering pace behind the idea that the government needs to be more attentive to the interests of the city. I think for much of the last four and a half years, the city felt rightly neglected uh, by successive governments uh, and sometimes slightly worse than neglect. I mean, sometimes it was kind of abuse, which is not a very good um, context in which to make people feel confident about the future. But I think that has uh, shifted. I think the, um, you know, the, the response that I discovered, I think, during my um, the review, the feedback I got, was that right across the market, on, on, you know, not just on one side of it, that people recognise we need to reform and change and get a crack on. And my view is that the politicians, the regulators and the market are now broadly aligned about the need to get on with constructing uh, a more nimble, competitive, dynamic regulatory future for the city. Well, which is a good excuse to um, to turn to Claire. Um, I, I, I seem to see nod, nodding through some of that. And um, would, would you say that's a fair reflection of, of, of where you and the, and the FCI are on this? Or the, or the mood in the city more generally? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's obviously a very difficult one um, to pick up on behalf of the, the, the whole of the organisation. But I mean, look, clearly we're alive to the fact that um, regulation and the burden of regulation has um, been extremely challenging over the last few years. I mean, we, we are, and you'll have seen through some of the comments that Nikhil has made in recent um, speeches, I think we probably are aligned with a desire to look um, from the bottom up and think about how how we respond to the challenges that the city is facing at the moment. The Hill Review, um, the Khalifa Review all pick up on um, a desire to be, and I think Lord Hill may have mentioned being more nimble, that, that, that's absolutely right. And um, it, it's difficult as a regulator. I mean, we, we have our objectives that we work to and you know, the, the, the challenge being that protecting consumers and promoting competition and still ensuring market integrity, are a re it's a really challenging balance. Um, but I think, I was, you know, it, it would be interesting to see the direction of travel with the FRF um, and how that uh, plays out. But, you know, more generally, the organisation, the FCA in particular, is going through a, a lot of change at the moment. Um, we recognize the need to transform and we need to respond to make, make better use of data intelligence in the way that we regulate and to be more efficient in how we do that um, and, and getting that balance right, but um, not an easy one. Um, did you have anything uh, to, to add on that or, or should I move on to the next question? No, I mean, only to briefly say, it, <sighs> I think Jonathan's completely right that the the ship has really sailed on equivalence. Um, there was a an alternate pathway, perhaps right after the vote, where we might have pursued single market membership or you know close alignment and, and prioritised those things. We didn't, um, and I it, it, it was always unrealistic that the UK would be a rule taker in the long term, given how important financial services are to us. So I detect the same shift that that really we're looking at. I think everyone in financial services wants to maintain high standards, but they also want that competitive divergence from European regulation. Oh, that's yeah. an interesting one, actually, Tom, if I can just pick yeah. up on that, because, yes, there, there is the move towards divergence. But then we also um, see, particularly in, say, the debt markets within the UK, a desire to try and keep closely aligned to ensure that there are, there are cross-border transactions and that... that um, that remains accessible. So there's, there's always a very um, mm -hmm. difficult balance to manage. Yeah, um, I, I, I promise this isn't I, this isn't going to become um, let's beat up on the FCA. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, just but um, two of the, the the first two questions we've had in from Chris Russell and Hugh Cavendish both, both slightly overlap. Um, uh, Hugh says, um, "How should the work of regulators be scrutinised?" And um, Chris asks whether there has been uh, you given the burden of regulation on the finance industry, which you, which you alluded to. Is there any prospect of a comprehensive cost benefit analysis of current and future prospective uh, regulation? 
Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's interesting one. We've, we've obviously been the subject of a number of independent reviews recently, and um, I don't want to particularly dwell too much on what has been um, uh, well publicised, and, and, and clearly our, our CEO and chair have spoken um, about these. I think we recognise, as I said earlier on, that, that, that there is a huge burden on um, financial services, the financial services industry, and you know, we, we need to change the way we work. And we've got an ambitious program in front of us to try and look at, you know, culture, people, technology, the full work. So um, I, I, we're not blind to that need. We're working hard at it. Um, I, you know, we, we, are, we are accountable to Treasury and, and to, to an extent um, how we should, how do you regulate the regulator? I mean, that's an interesting one. Probably one for Nikhil rather than me, if that's okay. <laughs> Um, Jonathan, Tom, anything uh, to add on that? Yeah. Can I can I pick up on on um, Hugh Please. Cavendish's uh, question um, and 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 more generally? So first first off, um, I want to kind of come to the defence of regulators generally. They have a miserably hard job to do, but they operate in a broader social and political context. I mean, what's tended to happen with our political classes? is that they have decided they don't want the responsibility for when things go wrong. So they've huge amounts of areas in our national life that I actually consider kind of political. They've decided to hive off to regulators because of previous crises, because they lost their nerve and they thought, let's give it to um, another, you know, a, a group of clever people can deal with this and then I, politician, won't get blamed for it. Then what happens, because regulation is bloody difficult, when things go wrong, they then point the finger at the people um, for, <laughs> to whom they've given responsibility, and then they whip up moral outrage when there are problems, because you know, they sort of think, well, this doesn't <laughs> have any consequence on me and I'll cover my own back by dumping on the regulator. And you create an environment in which it is extremely difficult for the regulator to take what I would consider a broader look or a look with more capacity for risk in it, because all the incentives on our regulators are to avoid risk. And those are put there partly through their statutory objectives and partly through the political and media context in which they operate. So that would be my first point. My second point, about um, you know the scrutiny uh, is a really important one, and uh, Claire mentioned earlier in in passing um, to the future regulatory framework review, I think it's called, um, where you know as a result of us leaving the EU, all the financial service regulations being onshored. So that whole question then of um, who is going to scrutinise that regulation? Because our Parliament is not set up to do it. Unlike the old European Parliament, uh, for all its problems, it was set up to have detailed scrutiny of financial services legislation. The UK Parliament is not. Um, so how are you going to have that scrutiny? Then there's a question of where's, where do the dividing lines come between the regulator and legislation? I mean, I, I think in principle, the idea that a regulator can move more quickly if risk changes either to tighten legislation or to remove or to relax it as the risk profile changes and to have more discretion, I think is quite an attractive one because you get, you know, if, if your goal, which is what my goal would be, is a more flexible, dynamic, evolving regulatory system where you're kind of working on it the whole time. Um, you need to give the regulator more discretion. However, if you give the regulator more discretion and uh, for the sake of argument, the regulator goes rogue or um, decides that they've suddenly got a zero appetite for risk in the economy, you've got a problem if you have devolved all responsibility to the regulator. So the question of accountability, how our political system um, can can 
operate in a way that gives the regulators more space, but also ultimately is able to, um, well, first set the framework. So then you're into the question of what should the objectives of our regulators be? And this is the whole debate about should they have a, a, an objective about competitiveness or about making sure London's attractive or growth, whatever it is, like many other regulators in our main competitor jurisdictions do. It takes you into that debate and it also takes you into the debate of scrutiny. So all I'd say to anyone listening in is this future regulatory framework review, which um, I keep struggling over the name, sounds really, really dreary. It's massively important and people should follow what's going on uh, pretty closely. Um, Tom, anything to add? Or, or... Yeah, I mean, just briefly, I think one of the, the ironies here is that on paper, um, Britain appears, compared to most of its peers around the world, to have a very good system of sort of regulatory scrutiny um, and control. Um, if you look at the sort of better regulation frameworks and the various government bodies that look at this stuff, the reams and reams of impact assessments that come out and are one in, one out, one in, two out, one in, three out rules and business impact targets and so on. This is clearly something that a lot of attention has been paid to over the years. Um, and yet, <laughs> when you speak to people who are being regulated, they tend not to think that whatever we're doing is very effective. Right. And um, so I think that there's there's a couple of things there. First, most of our focus um, in terms of a better regulation strategy is on the flow of new regulation. Um, and we, we do it kind of well, but there are some real deficiencies in the system. As I mentioned earlier, whole areas are excluded, um, anything to do with financial stability, anything coming from international institutions. Um, often what is being assessed at that regulatory impact assessment stage is not really the, the rule that's going to come into force, but the, the ability to create that rule. Sometimes they're bundled together. Um, it gets very confusing uh, very frequently. Um, the civil servant in charge will um, mysteriously uh, make the cost of the regulation just low enough, you know, by a million or so that it doesn't require independent scrutiny. Um, and so there are all those kinds of, of deficiencies built into the system, which I think we, we can address and, and hopefully try and make that better. Um, and I would say things like requiring post-implementation reviews of the actual rules and regulations and, and how they're taking effect um, and, and tying that with sunset clauses so that if you know, you're not convinced that something is uh, meeting its objective and doing so in a cost effective way a few years down the line, then that regulation will automatically expire. Um, but then when we think about the existing stock of regulation as opposed to the flow, that's something that we really don't think about very much at all. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that DEFRA is the only government department to have done a sort of comprehensive audit of all of the regulation that it's responsible for and how costly and how effective that has been. That's the sort of process that needs to be replicated, I think, across government um, as part of a better regulation strategy. Um, but just to just to echo Jonathan's point there, that, you know, don't blame the regulators who are doing very difficult jobs for this. Blame uh, the politicians and the government officials um, who create the frameworks that they operate in if, if, if there are problems. Uh -huh. Okay, well, we've we've got a few questions flooding in, so let's um let's go. I'm going to take two two of them together, um, one from uh, John Moulton and one from David Groom, because they kind of overlap. Um, John asks, um, where, if anywhere, do you see opportunity to gainfully reduce financial regulation? Um, and David asks, um, if you had if you could wave a magic wand and like and rewrite the regulations in any particular area of uh, financial services, where would each of the panelists uh, start afresh and why? Which I, which I think is, is kind of the same, I hope is kind of the same question in, in, in two different ways. Um, uh, if anyone wants, has any, wants, to, wants to go first. Um, Claire, Claire you, may, you, may, you may have to recuse yourself from, from this. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I think I can answer um, from uh, my, my specific role. So, I mean, my, my, my area of specialism is um, primary and secondary markets. So, um, for me, where would I rewrite regulation? I, I, I mean, I, I would start by uh, a comprehensive review of, of primary market regulation. I mean, I, I, there's an interesting question for me about how we make our regime more attractive, um, more modern. We picked up on some of this through the idea of dual class share structures um, and other ways to make the regime more attractive, thinking about 
the, the regulations around the level of disclosure needed in prospectuses for certain types of issues. I mean, there's a real opportunity to start again and make the regime far more efficient. And, and that, that, that's an area that, you know, I would really, really like to explore further. So that would be my, my main area, I guess. And one of the, as we all know, one of the great trends in the economy recently has been for firms remaining private rather than going public because of, because of, yeah. Hence, and, hence, and you know, there's, there's an interesting piece of re research there that we, we need to properly scrutinise. So why are they staying private? Why, why are public companies going private? When, when, when companies come to IPO, they, they dual run strategies. And, and you know, as, as a regulator, perhaps we haven't um, listened enough to the reasons why specific decisions are made. Uh, Tom, uh, just to change the order a bit, uh, give you a magic wand. What's the, what's the one area that you'd... Uh you'd, you'd re reduce slash rewrite? It, it, it's a difficult question because there's there's so much and, you know, it's also different from, from other bits um, with financial regulation. So, I mean, I think that my approach would be, as I outlined originally, to, to sort of go the other way. And if you're thinking about starting with a blank sheet of paper, identify very clearly and, and concisely what are the core objectives that you're trying to meet um, and then specifically come up with the, the best and most cost-effective ways of doing those things like you know, what rules actually ensure financial stability. I think there's an awful lot of micro regulation, which is aimed in that direction, but which doesn't necessarily further the objective um, in a cost effective way. So this, um, is, this, this is why you work for a think tank, because your answer can be rip up the, rip up, rip up the whole thing. Yeah, well, yeah, and I think the door was open to give that answer. <laughs> um, but I mean, if, if, if you look at specifics, I, mean, I think one of the things that, um, and it's, it's been a bugbear at, so many people for a long time, um, is the money laundering um, regulations that make, uh, certainly when you're dealing with the traditional established banks, um, such a pain in the neck often um, for businesses and sometimes for individuals. Uh, and I'm not sure anyone seems to think that they really stop the kind of money laundering that that they were intended to prevent. Um, and that there, that I, one of the big things I think is that um, you know, we've been in this low interest rate environment for a long time. Um, the British public, I think, is fairly unsophisticated when it comes to their uh, non-cash savings account investment options. Uh, but some regulation recently has, has made it more difficult for people to access um, financial advice um, for free or, or affordably or whatever. Um, at least that's what, that's what we hear from um, folks we speak to in the city. So I think addressing those issues, but they're there's such a huge um, range of things that you might want to take aim at um, here. <laughs> Just when you, my, my, my kids have now got back from school, so I will be on mute for uh, as, as, as much as I can. <laughs> Jonathan. Um, so just a couple of general points. The first is um, I think that a lot of the problem isn't, isn't solely the regulation. It's the kind of compliance culture that then is built around it. So the way in which compliance people in uh, businesses, legal advice, um, start constructing their own interpretation of regulation that goes even further than the regulation. And then you get uh, completely maddening and stultifying effects where, you know, in, in lots of businesses in FS, the the cost of compliance um, represents you know, a really very high uh, percentage of the business's um, running costs. So there's, there's a broader point about um, kind of mission creep from the regulation, which is uh, where the compliance people in companies and the corporate governance people take regulation and sort of extend its reach. Mm. I think the honest answer Mother, sorry, the only answer I can give because I don't know enough about some of the particular issues as they, you know, I don't run a business. So someone like John will know much more the direct effect of particular bits of regulation. But um, one, the reason that lay behind in my review, the recommendation that the government should have to make an annual state of the city report to parliament about what's going on, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what regulation is good, what needs to be relaxed, in, you know, what might need to be tightened, how are we doing at um, constructing a good, a good, a good uh, environment, is that you, 
the, the thought behind it was to try and set up a framework whereby the government would have, would then with the regulator, work at these issues over time. What tends to happen is um, traditionally, you get a sort of reformist spasm. Someone suggests something, everyone runs around a little bit and then they get tired and bored and move on. And the idea behind the, this annual report and making it to parliament was to try and put some structure in place so that the government uh, and others need to work at things and um, be held to account for their progress and uh, address some of these tricky mm -hmm. underlying issues over time. So that might help. My main advice though to people on the call, knowing as well the nature of this government, that if you go to ministers in the treasury with some practical real world examples of how regulation A or piece of legislation B is affecting your business and what the costs of it are and how it could be addressed, I think you'll find them in the mood to want to engage and try to improve things. So I don't think their mindset is, look, these are the rules, just hunker down and soak it up. I think their mindset is, if you can demonstrate to me why I need to change this and why in particular this piece of regulation is out of step with global standards more generally, and there are a number of facets of that where um, not just because of our former membership of the EU, but because we've chosen to do things in a particular way ourselves to ourselves, um, where you can bring the UK into the line with what's going on in other jurisdictions um, and what's consistent with global financial standards. And then I think if you can do that, I think your people will find the government is interested in addressing it. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I, I should add, um, if people are interested in this, um, Andrew Bailey's recent speech on this listed uh, three areas where the government is definitely, well, uh, you know, is that it's almost certainly going to go to make changes um, the way that European uh, um, rules are applied, intended for banks doing international transactions are being applied to small and mid cap um, banks in the UK. Um, the, the regulations on financial advice, I think, was something else he mentioned where, you know, essentially you're, you're sort of, sort of basically it's illegal to give people um, investment, investment advice if they're not already worth enough that they don't have to that they don't need it. Um, so that, that, you know, that, that, that it's worth seeing that. Um, we're kind of coming into the home stretch slightly. So if I could ask people to sort of, um, to, 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 and we've already got more questions than I think we're going to be able to get get through. So if I can ask people to um, sort of, sort of um, have sort of lightning round um, aspect uh, to, the, to the final few minutes. Um, so Neil Scarth asks, um, should we be thinking more about re uh, equivalence with the US than the EU? And um, I'm just going to put a couple of together to, to try and um, speed through this. And um, Keith Boyfield asks whether the city has become too expensive as a financial hub. Um, how can we compete with places where costs are lower um, in terms of salaries, rents, transport, ETC? So um, any thoughts on either of those? Welcome. So should I just cover very quickly um, views on US? I mean, I think one of the things that we will need to think about is the um, extent to which we can make our markets more accessible to other jurisdictions outside of Europe. We're thinking about it in the primary market space. You know, can, can we um, start to consider where companies have um, listings elsewhere, making it easier or where they, we can uh, take into account um, the disclosure they've provided in other markets? I think that's an area that's ripe for change. I think um, it probably will be inappropriate for me to comment on salary and rent. Um, <laughs> others will be more have more expertise, I'm sure. I thought the FCA had a specific remit to solve the housing crisis. But... Yes, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> you want to talk anything on that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think in a way, thinking sort of, you know, US EU, it, it's it's to me set up a bit as one of those sort of artificial choices, which has kind of lingering echoes of the, of the, of the Brexit um, argument. I mean, I think I, I'd say there's kind of global um, and we should be pitching ourselves to, um, what, to, 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 to ask, you know, where are global standards? When I was doing the listings review, uh, what we realized actually was it, it, it wasn't a choice between 
London and New York. When you look at a range of different centres, uh, they were operating um, more flexible um, regimes than we were. So I think we should constantly be looking around the world at what is going on. Um, and, um, you know, going back to what I said before, I, I, I think we shouldn't be um, diverging from the EU for the sake of it. There are some areas where we will want to stay close, um, you know, things like banking rules, which come internationally through Basel, I can't see us moving from particularly anytime soon. So I think, I think that on uh, costs of London, I mean, I think what a lot of people would say or have said in recent days to me, conversations from founders is actually the, the, the ability to attract the best and brightest people in the world to a small geographical space and give them access to capital is the most important thing to focus on. And so I, 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 I would, I, I think, put a plea in around that and, um, you know, visas, the ability of people, to, clever people to come freely here and get the money they need. That will, um, if you've got that, um, I suspect some of these other issues are, are not so high a priority. Uh, Tom, yeah. or should we just... Um... Yeah, well, just, uh, I think that, you know, 35 years on, um, people think of the Big Bang um, as a deregulation. Um, but really, the, the essence of it was about smashing open the old boys club and opening the city up to international competition. Um, and so that, I think this sort of speaks to the point about pursuing um, equivalence with the US or whatever. Um, to me, the more in, we can sort of trade internationally in services, the more global competition we can have, um, the better. And, and obviously, there are big regulatory barriers to that at the moment, not, not always of our own making. Um, and so that, that again, is a sort of Brexit opportunity, but it, it's very difficult. Um, I think also, you know, to key to point, of course, this is all about much more than regulation. Regulation is important, an important aspect. Um, there are tax elements, I would say that, given my job at the CPS. Um, and there are the points that, that Jonathan raised about the, the attractiveness to global talent. Um, so no, they, 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 you definitely need to take a holistic view. Okay, um, let's try and get two more rounds of questions in. Um, one which um, was actually on our original list of talking points for this event, so it's useful to go and spins off uh, Jonathan Hill's um, comments just then. It was about capital markets. Given, given we're now shut off from the EU, um, how do we uh, broaden and deepen our capital markets while maintaining our, our global standards? Um, and uh, a, a similar question um, on um, uh, but the bond, bond market, and in particular, um, retail investors' access to it, um, which wasn't co covered by the, the listing review. But um, you know, are, are there um, you know, retail investors are currently um, more or less excluded from bond markets, um, or have to go sort of go via bond funds? Um, would you be supportive of um, something open um, to to more investors and SM, retail investors and SMEs? Should I pick up on the? Um, the I'll pick up on the bond piece first because. Yes, um, not explicitly covered within the Hill Review, but it's something that we um, are looking for. I mean, you know, uh, obviously subject to the, the work we would need to do in this space and governance, et cetera. But uh, I mean, to, to my mind, it's it's mad that retail investors are not able to participate in um, really good quality bond offerings. Um, and clearly the, the, there's a challenge there in ensuring we get the right consumer protections that are I, a scenario that I would really like to look at, particularly um, where you have listed issuers uh, issuing bonds. So um, something very keen to look at. I mean, in terms of broadening markets, um, uh, you know, I, I, I picked up at the beginning on um, ESG and climate change. I think uh, it's an area where we can lead and I'm keen to do to see us do that I think we are keen as an organization to do that and, and diversity as well I think people um, uh, issuers companies firms benefit from diversity and it makes a real difference so another way of improving London I think that's just slightly different I guess from um, how you would normally narrowly consider our role um, just a couple of Quick points, Rob. I mean, the first is um, echoing what Tom was saying, that um, 
you know, the answer to the question of how you deepen and strengthen capital markets, uh, you know, is linked to questions of tax. It's linked to um, uh, the, the you know, questions of research. It's obviously linked to the thing we touched on earlier about the kind of secular shift from uh, public markets to private. And there, I think, one cannot um, have that discussion without thinking about the bit of the conversation we also had about the costs of compliance and the burden of regulation that's put on public companies. I mean, you know, th there is a reason why uh, public companies are finding it harder for people to want to become directors. Uh, there's a reason why people are choosing to um, uh, stay private or go private. So there, I think, one comes in very, um, you know, that there will be choices and, um, you know, hard choices between, uh, if you like, um, you know, the sort of investor projection ESG uh, kind of agenda and the fact that, you um, you know, uh, quite a lot of businesses are, are feel strongly that they're already quite heavily encumbered with compliance. So getting, getting, getting the balance right is incredibly hard. Um, my view is over a period of time, the balance has tilted too much one way. And that, I suppose, in how we have thought about the listing review was... Um, you know, uh, seeing if one could reset um, reset the dial a bit. But knowing I had the um, good fortune of having the FCA behind me to actually do the work and check whether every, anything we said was worth doing or not. So, um, you know, I was I was fortunate to be able to <laughs> depend on Claire and her team. Well, I, I think you've also covered the, the next one of the next questions I was going to ask, which was about um, from Nick King, a, a, a research fellow at the CPS, on um, uh, the danger of reducing standards for, for IPOs. But um, uh, Tom, uh, anything? I mean, that? we can move on to any further questions if you want, Rob, because um, I think. Okay, well, we've got, we've, got, we've got two minutes left, um, so I will just ask. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I will. I, I, will, I will put two, the, two, the two challenges which have come up to, to Lord Hill um, in the thing. So Nick asks, um, Romy Savova, a founder of Pension B, um, talked about the danger of reducing standards ahead of her likely IPO. Um, are you in any way concerned that some of the best run companies might be put off by any dilution or amending of current rules? Um, and uh, further down, um, someone asked, aren't SPACs just a bubble and aren't you exposing, uh, aren't, aren't we, wouldn't we just be exposing British investors to the same, to, uh, to when, it goes, uh, when it goes pop? I think, yeah. yeah. So, so both, on both points, I mean, the, <laughs> the, the answer boils down to a question of balance. So um, uh, did, did we in our proposals um, come up with a range of things that, uh, you know, were, were a willful ripping up of um, investor protection and taking the UK off into a crazy wild west. No. I mean, the, the, uh, the point I made earlier, Rob, was that um, it wasn't about us opening up a gap between our competitors. It was about trying to narrow a gap. There is nothing in the report uh, that um, goes beyond what you can find in uh, other well-regulated financial jurisdictions. Where we have recommended making some changes, we always, in all our proposals, uh, sought to balance that with further safeguards. My basic point on uh, the IPO one, though, is um, that, you know, we don't want... Um, to move away from having high standards of investor protection. But if we end up with standards of investor protection, the so-called, you know, the gold standard, and it has the effect that a number of potential IPOs choose to go to other jurisdictions, then no one in the UK, no investor, is going to be able to participate in it in the same way. So um, do, do, do I think it's sensible to um, have... A, a space that is so well regulated that no one chooses to go in it. Uh, no, I don't. Um, so that was the approach on that. On, on SPACs, uh, I'm not a great, I'm, so my view on SPACs, SPACs is not to be a cheerleader for SPACs, 
I completely recognize that, um, you know, there are people have proper points about, you know, the bubble, uh, about uh, safeguards around it, if it's too small, uh, redemption rights, all of that. And, and those points are well made. The, the point though is, they look to be something that I, I don't think they're probably in their final state. They are evolving. If we think that in some evolved form, they are going to be part, a permanent part of the landscape uh, in the US, elsewhere in Europe, it's a very big call by the UK to say, we do not ever want to be part of this process. We can see so clearly now that we want to close down all discussion and debate and just um, say we'll never have them. I think it's better to have the discussion, which by making a recommendation, that makes it possible. So Claire and her team will look at that. We can then look, she can look, um, at what safeguards you might want to put in place to uh, protect that if you think it's something that's right to do. Um, and investors ultimately can take a view as to whether it's something they want to invest in or not. But if we had not made a recommendation, everything I've just said would have been completely academic uh, because effectively we would not be able to participate in them because of a particular rule in place. Um, and we might, had we taken that, have woken up in a few years time and thought, oh dear, the UK has just missed out on this thing, which is permanent and has settled down into you know, a steady state, offering companies an alternative to IPO, and the UK has decided not to be part of it. And I thought that would have been a very big call. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I mean, Claire or Tom, uh, unless you have anything to, to add on that? No. Oh, okay. Well, I will, in that case, I will say thank you very much to our three panellists, and thank you all for watching. Um, your statutory reminder that you can follow the CPS on Twitter, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, all, uh, all, uh, all, all Instagram, Clubhouse, um, all, all kind of things. Um, and we, we, we'd really be grateful if you did so that you, we can tell you about at, uh, more brilliant events like this. But thank you very much to our three panelists. Um, thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.